I'd like to open up the floor for uh, Q and A. Um, and just comment. Yeah, if you yeah. could just come up here, June will kind of hand the microphone to you. Any questions that you might have, feel free to just step Come right on up. down. We don't bite. Say your name. Yes, please yeah. say your name and where you're from. Yep. I actually had more comments. I'm Julie Sue, and I'm from San Francisco. I'm actually a fourth generation San Franciscan. Um, I'm also an attorney at the Department of Insurance. So what it, what's really important is to have all the documents together because I've had friends call me and tell me that their parents had a long-term care plan. And then they'll try to file for claims if uh, a parent has enough dementia where they might need to actually live in an assisted facility. Um, and then they get no answer from the insurance company or typically some kind of denial. So I would say kind of know more about your agencies and your friends who can help you. Um, because oftentimes, if it's not documented properly, you don't get the first care. Also, um, don't overlook third-party intermediaries when talking about things like advanced care directives or palliative care. I sit on the board of St. Francis Memorial Hospital, and the great thing is because it's so close to Chinatown, we had a session all in Cantonese, and um, the head of palliative care actually talked about caring on a chronic level, I mean, well before somebody's ready for hospice, and it goes through in detail. I, as an attorney, don't, don't really like the advanced care directives, or at least the past ones that are really simple, like, would you like to be resuscitated? This actually um, chronicled what are your thoughts on blood transfusions, organ transplants, all this other kind of things. And so, um, but having a session somewhere where it's a taboo subject, but there's a third party intermediary actually makes it easy. And when they go as a community group and it's partnered with um, different organizations, it makes it a lot more comfortable. Um, and also, I kind of am concerned about this generation where they're not here at the family table because you learn a lot about your family and what your parents' thoughts are about life and death um, if you have your everyday dinners or even the weekly dinners. So um, I hope that um, some of the millennials put down their phones. Yeah. <laughs> um, and finally, um, I want to let you know that NYU for a while actually had an interactive um, interpretation um, on medical terms and specific diagnoses in Mandarin and in Cantonese and had the characters, the pinyin, the Yale Cantonese romanization. And I think this is a time for ARP to call on our community colleges. City College of San Francisco actually has a medical interpretation certification program. Unfortunately, it's only during the day and professionals like a lot of attorneys, nurses and doctors would like to take advantage. So I'm kind of urging, um, I guess, the country to think about giving funding to our community colleges so if people want to be more language proficient to really help immigrants. Um, and one last word, you know, some seniors, even if they're English proficient, if they happen to be immigrants and English is a second acquired language, oftentimes they lose the English. So while you're used to com um, communicating with your parents solely in English, if um, he or she has a stroke, oftentimes they'll only remember um, Cantonese or Mandarin, and then you're going to have to figure out how to communicate. And sundowning. I noticed in my mother towards sundown, she just looks at a blonde person and will speak Chinese to them, Mandarin. Mm -hmm. The sundowning effect at um, twilight. Mm -hmm. And language. then there are cultural mm -hmm. issues with the doctor, so don't be um, afraid to be pushy and bossy. Yeah. Um, and yeah, the other thing is about it. siblings. Like, I'm the oldest, so I grew up being the responsible one. And if you think your siblings might step up to the plate when a crisis happens, it doesn't always happen, so you can't have any kind of resentment. You just got to do what you need to do. Yeah, that's what I also told somebody the other day, too, because I have two older brothers and two older sisters. I'm the youngest, but not everybody jumps up to the plate right away, or, you know, people deal differently as well. So to have that resentment doesn't help. You know the main goal, which is to give them the best care possible. I see Daphne kind yeah, of. So like I don't want to hog more. this up and, yeah. and just no. help your friends and your yeah. network. That's Thank you, you know the best. Part the stage advice. Right. Thank you yeah. so much. Awesome. I wonder if there's any sons or grandsons in the audience who want, would like to share a male point of view on this, because um, you're all stepping up to the plate. It's quite a large percentage. Could you do me, yeah, could, yeah, right. could you do me a favor and come up here to, so we could see you? And, and it might be easier to stand off to the side. Yeah. You don't have yeah. to face us because it's not. Yeah, yeah. well, well here is where right the camera is. Right here is going to be. If you're so cool right there. 
wherever the camera's at. Where do you prefer? What do you prefer? How about over here then? Director. Director. Well, either Steve, here, right here. Director. Where? Right here. Yeah. You look good. You're, you're fine, fine you're here. Good. No, you're this good. way he Thanks. can talk to us yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, name. Okay. Yeah. You yeah. talk to everybody. And your name, sir? Yeah. Uh, Tim. Tim Yip. Yeah. Hey, Tim. So go ahead. You have questions for me as being the son? Anyone? Oh, no. yeah. Just tell us about your story. Speak from your heart. Yeah. Oh, okay. Do I still have one left? Um, I'm a caregiver twice. I am the caregiver to my nephew since 2009, brain tumor. And he's a mess. And I now also take care of my mom. Well, she's in an $8,000 a month uh, assisted living, but we have hands-on care. And uh, I've been doing that since uh, 2010. Wow. Alzheimer's dementia. Yeah. Wow. So, uh, how two old, on one. How old is your son? Not your nephew? My yeah. nephew, uh, 10 year survivor, three relapses. Wow. He's now um, 32. Oh so he was diagnosed when he was 20. Wow. Oh, so wow. How, how are you taking care of yourself? Because a lot of times we forget to take care of ourselves. Uh, so easy. I'm not. Yeah. I'm not, but I have, but I'm a 10 year survivor now. Mm. So I've kind of learned the tricks mm. and I've been learning a lot about uh, taking care of myself and you have to eventually. And yeah. uh, I take uh, frequent breaks and you just have to say, uh, you have to step back and say, okay, I've done my time. Someone fill in. I don't care who fills in anymore. I just, yeah. and I'll come back in. Yeah. yeah. So I'm the primary, mm. and I help my uh, my nephew's uh, father. He's 24/7. Mm. Um, do you have any advice for people in your shoes at the moment uh, in terms of things that you've learned as a caregiver, intergenerational caregiver? Uh, Get help if you if there's help there, mm. and if not, then it's on you. And just do the best you can. Anything you do will be acceptable, mm -hmm. because no one else is not ready to do it. Mm -hmm. Whatever issues hold them back. And stuff. Yeah. One thing I, I in interviewing Richard that I uh, kind of resurfaced for me that I I wanted to share was that there are people also that want to help. You just have to reach out. It's kind of like I think you said calling your tribe or calling your you know your your support group could be family, friends, but that's also important because I was shutting people out, trying to take care of things myself too, when other right. people also wanted to step in. Yeah, and sometimes it's just uh, a call, not even talking about yeah. that. So like Jeanette, who was in, in the piece, and yeah. her husband Mike and I grew up together, and Regina also were very close-knit friends, mm -hmm. they were all caregivers. Yeah. So I, I knew, I don't know, reach out to Jeanette or Nick, I said, you know, could you talk about this, right? And I knew that she would understand and, and look, I mean, I'm, I'm curious who, who in the room and you're, you're a caregiver, who, who are, who are, who is a caregiver right now or you were a caregiver? It was like half the room. Yeah. Um, and the thing is regarding caregiving, Thanks. it doesn't have to be hands-on. Yeah, absolutely. It could be someone, when you get home after your, what I do, 12-hour shifts, there's a meal there waiting for you. That's yeah. caregiving. Yeah. And they have to do it in their way. Yep. Because it's tough, especially when family's involved. If you're not a like, professional caregiver and you really don't have any kind of investment, because um, when your heart's involved, it pulls at you from a different way. Yeah. You know, that's why they don't, uh, if it's true in the medical field, you don't operate on your own son and daughter. And basically, that's what you're doing. Yeah. Especially when it's family. Just because there's certain things, oh my God, I can't handle it, or that's not the way, I, I can't touch him that way, or her that way, and stuff like that. Yeah. So sometimes it's nice to have that third party that doesn't have that emotional heartstrings that pull on you. Yeah. They, can, they can do the dirty stuff. Yeah. So well, here, go ahead. When was the aha for you where you said, oh gosh, that role that I have carried out, either in my family and or in my life, is now not the role I need to take on now. Because I think that's the, that's the first sort of like, oh my God, I got to take on this different role now, which means dealing with your parents in a different way, right? And, and, and dealing with your loved ones in a different way. Was it just gradual? When people ask me that, I just said I was born to do it. Uh -huh. mm. They called me for some reason, uh, besides all the other stuff I was doing, um, I just happened to be at the right place at the right time, and my nickname was the Death Merchant. With the, the what? The death merchant. Because they would send me in. Like I took my mom's husband to the other side. Yeah. 
she called me uh, before she starts slipping into Alzheimer's. She goes, I can't take care of my, uh, my husband anymore. I need you. Mm. So I dropped my stuff that I was doing with my brain tumor nephew, mm. went down and brought her husband to the other side mm. the last three weeks of his life, uh, stage four of pancreatic cancer. Mm. And it was, like you said, it is an honor. It was a spiritual experience. It was yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, nothing in this world would have ever paid me for him holding his hand and bringing him across to the yeah. other side. Yeah. And, we, and when he passed away, we were watching uh, the show. And then once he passed, I said, you know what? He's dancing with the stars now. Yeah. And that's what he was watching. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Well yeah. said. Yeah, yeah. Up. it's just, um, I think for this kind of, especially when we caregive for our relatives and loved ones, um, either you are or you aren't, and that's not to say right or wrong, it's just that's the way it is. Mm. And if you're not the one, get someone. Mm. Get somebody, pay somebody, mm. whatever. Yeah. Because your circle of friends, someone will step forward. And it, like I said, it doesn't have to be hands-on. It could be that meal. Let me drive you to work. Let me pick you yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You know, I, I, one of my one of the best things somebody said to me when my father passed away, and we're still caregiving for other people in our families. My friend Keely, a childhood friend of mine, she said, "Tuan, if you just need me to come and hold your hand, or if in the middle of the night and you need me to sit in silence because you're scared because you feel alone, like I'm there." And that meant so much to me. Thank you so much for sharing oh, your story. Yeah. I think we have somebody else. Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Kevin Lee. I'm from San Jose. Thank you so much for sharing your stories uh, with us. A um, couple questions. I'll ask the first one, or ask one at a time. But my first question is, if you could talk about the uh, dynamics of, you know, your parents, they, they raised you, they took care of you, they're the head of the household, and then, you know, now you're having to change that relationship and be the one to, you know, be the decision maker and how, you know, that went with, with them. For me, I just have to say, everything that I ever sat back at my mom when I was 16 is coming back to me in spades. <laughs> <laughs> laugh about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, we laugh a lot, actually, yeah. along with my mom and some of the decisions that now we have to take on. We just laugh at different steps of the process. No, mom, you know, you're, you're crazy that way. Let me just say, yeah, you're, you know, you're right. I am kind of like, because she's, she's very detail-oriented. We'll make fun of the fact that she's, she'll laugh, too. And yeah. that, that's really helped, I think, as, as we have, you in that too. arc of the change of the role, yeah, which we were talking about, right, which you bring up so adeptly, was, you know, uh, not that this is like a, should be a fun thing, necessarily, yeah. overall, because I know it's very painful, uh, but enjoy as much as you can along the way, yeah, and laugh about it. Yeah, that's great. Humor is huge. and It's well, real. Well, yeah, and one of the things that I kept watching over and over and over in the piece when we were editing is when you were just walking with your dad and we got that last shot and he's like, I love you, Richard. You know, he, it was so heartfelt. And he's like, I'm so glad you're here. You know, and that, like, every time I watch it, I get really teary-eyed because it's those simple moments. And it's the simple moments with your dad. You know, you, you saw the gum part. His dad reverted back to this, you know, this, space in this place where he became that generous person again because he didn't have to take care of other people and kids and worry about paying bills and all that. So I, I, it, the spiritual journey that you, uh, you mentioned was just, I, for me, is the perfect sort of uh, words that describe my journey. Yeah, and, 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 it's, and I think what has been said by many here is, you know, it's, it's, and I'll, maybe I'm paraphrasing the wrong way, but it's like, oh, okay. I'm watching my loved one die in front of me. Mm. It's a long yeah. goodbye. Right? Yeah, a long yeah. goodbye. There's lots yeah. of different ways of saying it. Uh, but you know what, as I've uh, looked at this, and it's very early on for me, certainly this the last year, is instead I'm really watching him be reborn again. And I mm. said this to you yeah. in peace, because he, yeah. he's discovering neat little things about stuff. The I mean, pigeons, the kids. The, pi oh, the like, pigeons, oh, the kids. Yeah, the when we went on a walk with them, it was or, so endearing. Or that, 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 look at that cloud. Yeah. It, it looks like a marshmallow. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. whatever it might be that's yeah. kind of cool again, yeah. uh, he really digs it. Yeah. A Subway sandwich. Yeah. Oh, man, he does a Subway sandwich. 
Subway sandwich every day for lunch. All right. <laughs> yeah. Apple fritters. Yeah, don't it. <laughs> See, mine is different because my mom's mind is totally clear. Mm. It's just that her body, her physical walking, the mobility, right. the balance. Yeah. So she will often say to me, er, which is a very Hunan, you know, um, diminutive, of, you know, daughter, er, what dre lei ni? I am tiring you. I am mm, a burden yeah. to you. My grandma said so that too. So she's fully my aware of yeah. what is her cause in my life. Yeah. But, you know, here in 21st century America, there yeah. is no other solution for us other than a paid caregiver because we have absolutely no blood relatives because mm. they left China first and then they came as immigrants to America. Mm. So I know that a lot of us are facing that when yeah. we're just a nuclear family. Yeah. Mm. So interesting because I've experienced the stage that you're at and I've experienced the stage yeah. that you're at. Yeah. And, and I can say that now that I've gone beyond, you know, losing five family members in a short time, that I was trying to think about today and what it meant to me. And there are three words that sort of popped up and I kind of jotted them down. One is discussion, talk about it, because it's so important to share your story and start sharing this you know, learning more about your family story. Um, so we hope that this tonight has, you know, sort of sparked some, some thoughts and hopefully some conversation amongst your own circle, your own family. The other thought was inspiration. Because, you know, when we were talking, when I, after I interviewed you guys, sure, there are sad things, but there was a fun that I saw you having with your dad. There was these little moments. You know, you saw Elizabeth when, when I said, come on now, you enjoy it. She goes, of course I do, you know? And it was just, it makes me, it gives me the chills, you know? Um, so uh, hopefully this inspires you to really be prepared to care. Just look through that, that book, take it with you when you're on a long part ride or whatnot, um, and start just, you know, the conversation and look at that toolkit. The third thing is hope and realizing that you're really not alone in this journey. You know, these are my caregiving, I call her Big Sister Lily now, uh, but, uh, but you know, this, you, I, we are all really connected mm -hmm. um, by this thing that, we, that is love. It really is a circle of love. So I am so honored. Thank you, Daphne, Edna, your whole team and everyone for sharing, um, for allowing me to share the story. Um, do you have one more question? Yeah, I need okay. question. Okay, yeah. Kevin has one more uh, question. Uh, my next question was, you know, so, for me, my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer stage four uh, 10 years ago, and then she ended up passing away um, three years later. And I was able to, during that time to move back home and, and help take care of her. But one of the things that I was really grateful for that, you know, despite her eventually succumbing to it, was any past um, conflicts or, you know, just issues we had, we were able to work out and so I was able to send her off, you know, yeah. like in, in peace without any regrets. And so I'm just wondering if you, as you are caregiving now, how you are handling, you know, conflict or past conflict or even ongoing conflict now with uh, the person you're giving care to. For me, I'm so afraid that my mom will fall. So a catastrophic fall will be the end for her. So I've told her, um, you know, it's so funny because she tried to escape communism with all their slogans. I've got a slogan for her now. If no one's touching you, don't move. <laughs> and she is not listening. <laughs> so, but it's, it's, there's always going to be daily conflicts, but the bigger picture is they do realize what we are doing for them. Yeah. And they, you know, innately know that. Just like Elizabeth's mom, when we had that moment, um, really quick behind the scenes um, story is, she told me, my mom is really tough. And she used some words that I was like, whoa, that's crazy. And your mom, my mom doesn't really want you here. She just what, she doesn't really want people in our house. And so, you know, I do the, the silly little Asian thing, take off my shoes, and I brought her my favorite tea, and then kind of spoke in broken Cantonese, as you can see. Thank you, God, for that, that subtitler. But right when I went there, she was like, oh, go, go home, go home, you know? And, um, you know, we just started to chat, and I, you know, a little bit uh, more, and then with the kid, the, the grandchild came in, she got all excited. Then she was like, I'm tired, and she went inside, and we didn't interview her yet or talk to her. And so I was like, can I follow her in there? And um, she was like, sure. And so I just sat there and I was like, what are you reading? And she was just like, oh, I read every day, this blah, blah, blah. And then I said, um, did you read your kids? And I was just talking a little bit about her kids. And gosh, uh, you know, in my broken Cantonese, I was like, your heart must be so happy, huh? And that's when she just totally like opened up. It's beautiful. Yeah. And there was that deep connection that we, I felt with all of you guys and, and these stories that, and I'm sure that you guys felt um, watching it and um, amongst you and your family members as well. So. Um, Thank you again oh, for thank sharing you. your stories. Thank you so much, Edna, Daphne, AARP team, uh, for sharing your stories. Thank you. Thank you.
you. And everybody for coming. I know. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, yeah. for coming. I wanted to thank Jeanette also and Mike Wong. Jeanette was in the piece. Caregiver for our father and family members as well. Uh, thank you so much for coming and chatting. Yeah.